This is the Sri Ramana Maharshi Satsang, a time to listen, reflect, and deeply meditate. Know yourselves and be always free and at peace. Welcome. I'm Richard Clark, hosting this satsang. I'm not a guru or a teacher. I love this teaching, so I want to share it. I'm reviewing and commenting on the book Talks with Sri Ramana Maharshi. This week is from Talk 129. The financial secretary of Mysore asked, Is Paul Brunton's secret path useful for Indians as well? Maharshi says, Yes, for all. The questioner says, the body, the senses, etc., are not I. This is common amongst us, but how to practice it? And Maharshi says, by the threefold method mentioned therein in Paul Brunton's Secret Path. The questioner asks, is breath control necessary for inquiry? Maharshi says, not quite, which is an interesting answer. Then there is the question, there is a blankness intervening, it is said in the book. Maharshi says, yes, do not stop there. See for whom the blankness appears. Then the questioner says, for devotees, there is no blankness, it is said. Maharshi, even there, there is the latent state, laya. The mind wakes up after some time. The questioner asks, what is the experience of samadhi? Maharshi, it is as it is. For onlookers, it may seem to be a swoon. Even to the practitioner, it may appear so in the early experiences. After a few repeated experiences, it will be all right. The questioner asks, do they soothe nadis, the energy centers? or do they excite them by such experiences? Maharshi says they are excited at first. By continued experience, it becomes common and the man is no longer excited. The questioner says, proceeding on safe lines, there should be no unpleasantness. Excitement is uncongenial to smooth being and working. Maharshi replies, a wandering mind is on the wrong way. Only a devotional mind is on the right way. In this dialogue from talks with Sri Ramana Maharshi, the financial secretary of Mysore is inquiring about the applicability of Paul Brunton's secret path for Indians. And Ramana provides insights on the path of self-inquiry and the nature of spiritual practice. Let's review these dialogues step by step. First, the question by the financial secretary, is Paul Brunton's secret path useful for Indians as well? And Maharshi says, yes, for all. The financial secretary asks whether the teachings presented in Paul Brunton's secret path are relevant and useful for Indians. Ramana Maharshi affirms that the teachings are universal and applicable 
to everyone, not limited by nationality or background. Brenton's threefold method is first, intellectual questioning and philosophical inquiry, then moral and ethical development, and then meditative practices. So the questioner asks, the body, the senses, etc., are not I. This is common amongst us, but how to practice it? And Maharshi says, by the threefold method mentioned therein. So the questioner acknowledges that many people understand that the body and the senses are not the true self, the real I. But he's asking how to practically implement this understanding. Ramana refers to the threefold method, as mentioned in Paul Brunton's book, as the approach to be used for practice, that is, reflection, ethical development, and self-inquiry. Then the questioner asks, is breath control necessary for inquiry? And Maharshi says, not quite. So the questioner asks about the necessity of breath control, pranayama, in the practice of self-inquiry. Maharshi indicates that while breath control can be helpful, it's not an essential aspect of the practice. Not quite is an interesting answer. It seems to encourage breath control as helpful in quieting the mind so that deep inquiry is possible. It's not the breath control that does it, rather it is the quieting of the mind. The questioner says, there is a blankness intervening, is said in the book. Maharshi says, yes, do not stop there. See for whom the blankness appears. The questioner mentions a state of blankness that's described in Brunton's book. Ramana agrees that such an experience can occur but advises not to get stuck there. He encourages looking deeper into the experiencer of the blankness, inquiring into the source of this experience. The blankness is known. Who is the knower? Then the questioner says, for devotees, there is no blankness, it is said. And Maharshi says, even then, there is the latent state, laya. The mind wakes up after some time. The questioner refers to the idea that devoted practitioners might not experience this blankness. Maharshi explains that even for those practitioners, the mind is submerged in laya at rest, and eventually the mind will become active again. So this blankness is just temporary. The questioner asks, what is the experience of samadhi? And Maharshi says, it is as it is. For onlookers, it may seem to be a swoon. Even to the practitioner, it may appear so in early experiences. After a few repeated experiences, it will be all right. 
the questioner asks about the experience of samadhi and Ramana describes it as an experience that is what it is beyond any easy description. He notes that outsiders might perceive it as a state of swoon or unconsciousness, and even practitioners might see it as such initially. But with repeated experiences, these perceptions evolve. This is like Ramana, who lived in silence for a number of years in uh, Tirupanamali after his self-realization. The questioner asks, do they soothe nadis or do they excite them by such experiences? And Maharshi says, they're excited at first. By continued experience, it becomes common and the man is no longer excited. The questioner asks whether the experiences of samadhi calm or excite the nadis, the energy channels. Ramana explains that initially these experiences can excite the nadis, but with sustained practice, they become ordinary and the practitioner is no longer overly affected by them. And the dialogue concludes with the statement from the questioner, proceeding on safe lines, there should be no unpleasantment. Excitement is uncongenial to smooth being and working. And Maharshi replies, a wandering mind is on the wrong way. Only a devotional mind is on the right way. The questioner expresses concern about avoiding unpleasantness and excitement in the spiritual journey. Maharshi advises that a mind prone to distraction and restlessness is on the wrong path. He suggests that a mind devoted to a higher ideal is the proper approach to progress in the spiritual journey. This devotional focus reduces the tendency of the mind to reach into the pleasures of the world for happiness. For deep practice, the mind needs to be silent. Devotion is one way to accomplish this. Overall, the dialogue reflects Ramana's emphasis on self-inquiry as a universal path. His insights into the various states of experience and his guidance on maintaining a steady and focused mind on the spiritual path. So know yourself and be always free and at peace. And now we have a talk from Know Me, Know Yourself. And it's got the oldest picture of Know Me I can find. <laughs> That you should know yourself is the advice of all the wise. How can you know yourself when being is not an object? How can you not know yourself, your own being, which is consciousness, self-luminous?
in the spiritual instruction, the Maharshi has pointed out, are there two selves that one should know or not know the other? Who is it that would wish to know the self? Or who is it that is subject to the illusion of ignorance and its consequent bondage? And who is desirous of liberation because he intuits it's his natural state? Without knowing yourself as you really are, what can really be known? If you treat the self as if it were an object to be attained or lost, to enter into as if it were a state, or to depart from as if you would come down from that state, to treat the self as if it were an object is delusive. The self signifies yourself. And all the teachings of the sages and scriptures that speak of the self, the absolute, are speaking of you in your real nature. What are you in your real nature? Your experience so-called, your knowledge so-called, of anything else depends upon the view of yourself, the definition of yourself. This is why Sri Bhagavan says in Saddarshanam, Truth Revealed, that it is only as long as the ego is taken to exist, there is the ego sense, will there be the threefold division of the universe, the individual, and the Supreme Self or God. The three are not really three, he says. The division, the multiplicity, appears only so long as oneself is not known. The self, which is pure being, consciousness, bliss, is ever existent. It is non-dual, and it alone is. If that very same self is assumed to be, through the power of imagination, an individual entity or ego, then all illusion sprouts from there. Since it is illusion, it is not really existent, but it seems to be. If we want illusion to vanish and perceive reality in such a manner that reality comprehends itself, then we must know who we are. And how else to know who you are unless you question the very one that seems to be individualized even now? What is it that you refer to as I in yourself? And now we'll take a few minutes to inquire. You exist and you know that you exist. Inquire, investigate within yourself. Who am I beyond the body and senses? Who am I beyond the body and mind?
Is the blackness a stopping point or a gateway? Who experiences and how? Who experiences the blankness who am i I exist, what actually exists? All right. And we'll close with our chant. Oh. Oh. Shanti. 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 Om. Peace. 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 Comments, discussion. Do you like that know me picture? <laughs> yeah. That was quite a while ago, huh? Yeah, I think it was in the 1980s sometime. I think that was before we went to see Nomi. He looked like a baby. Yeah, he was sitting in a nice setting there. Yes. Now, they did that occasionally in the early days that I was there, went outside and had some kind of uh, event, you know, some kind of teaching in nature. Mm. We went with him once. It was up some hill. I remember walking up some hill and then sitting in on the hill or something. Right. And I thought it was interesting that uh, Maharshi, when asked about breath control, if that helps uh Ramana said something like what not quite yeah yeah cuz it, it, it does it's it does slow the mind but mm -hmm. then it comes back with so much force that mm -hmm. uh, it's uh it's not as uh efficient or recommended as inquiry mm. you know 
because I think with with inquiry, we're really turning the mind in mm -hmm. and then restraining or working on restraining it from going out again. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly that's the key. Uh, what I still found in uh, practice, especially in the early days, that doing uh, mindful breath watching was what I had to do to get my mind quiet enough to inquire. So mm. in the early days, I would sit down for 20 minutes of inquiry and watch my breath for 17 minutes and actually inquire for a couple of minutes. So that's kind of a, a Buddhist uh, and uh, self-inquiry kind well, of concept. Well, that's, you know, considering I started with uh, the prior Buddhist experience and had been uh, looking into breathing meditation since my middle 20s. Mm -hmm. I'm so fortunate that you were looking for that, you know? Uh-huh. I was looking for it in all the wrong places. Till it finally found you. Right, until we found Nomi, and then Nomi actually started to explain so I could comprehend this stuff that I had been reading all those years. After about a year with Nomi, I went back and read a lot of the Buddhist things that were murky to begin with. And after some time with Nomi, they were very clear. So you, were able glad to go, it, you were able to go deeper. That's right. And I'm glad Nomi was such a good Buddhist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, good to see you. Good to uh, be with you and uh, to join together in our spiritual journey. And namaste. And namaste. see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.